Uh, Christine and Liz, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. It's indeed an honour to be here this evening to address you for the CEW annual dinner. I was actually enrolled in the program in 2007 for a short period before I went to Iraq, and I found it an excellent opportunity to not only share experiences but also to learn from other women. And I know there are some other Army women here this evening who have also had the benefit of the CEW program. But tonight I would like to share some of the insights of what it's like to be in the Army and what I've learnt through my experiences. As Christine said, uh, I joined in 1983 at the ripe old age of 18 when I thought I knew pretty well everything. And I decided that it would be a great idea to leave my phys ed degree and come and join the Army. And so I arrived in Sydney with about 30 other women with really not a great idea about what to expect in my Army training. And needless to say, it wasn't a particularly good start. And in fact, I managed to get four extras, so that's extra drill, where you spend a bit more time on the playground than everybody else, within, all 10 minutes of arriving. <laughs> and our training used to be conducted over in Mosman, and the heinous crimes that I had done was to cross my arms, lean on the wall, and chew gum. <laughs> so one of the... Uh, Obviously, one of the issues there was that I was having a little bit of trouble fitting into the army. So after about three months of being in quite a bit of trouble, I decided that really what I needed to do was to go back to Ballarat and finish off my physical education degree. I didn't choose to tell my parents that this was my latest, greatest idea, but I had written back to the university and they said, yes, we'll take you back. In fact, we'll take you back next semester. So I applied to resign. Unfortunately, because I was 18, that meant that the commanding officer, who was a man, of course, in those days, decided that he would ring up my parents, and to which he described the fact that I had applied to resign. And he said, so there's two options. Uh, we can keep her here in the training, or we can send her back to Ballarat. Now, given that my parents had managed to send my brother to the Navy and myself to the Army and didn't have any children at home for 18, after that 18-year period, you can imagine that the response was, put it in the round file, she'll like it eventually. <laughs> and of course, 30 years later, um, he was clearly right. But just to make sure that I didn't come back to Ballarat, my parents decided that they would fly up to Sydney and come and visit me to reinforce the value of serving the nation. And so I took them on a visit around what was then the Women's Royal Australian Army Corps School in Mosman, and they were marvelling at the beautiful views, perhaps not the buildings for those of you who've seen uh, the location there. And I took them into the area where we had our bar, and we had a merit board. And this merit board, included a lot of stars on it. So if you happened to get an extra drill, you would get a bronze star, a bit like those ones that children put in, put in their school book. If you'd been perhaps a little bit more devious, you would get a silver star, and that would include stoppage of leave. And if you're a real star, you would get a gold star. So my parents came through this room and they looked up on the merit board and there I was on the top of the merit board. <laughs> so back to Ballarat they went, absolutely delighted that I was doing so well in my <laughs> academics. <laughs> so as you can see, um, the army certainly that I joined in the 80s is quite different to the army that we have now. In fact, there were only about 6% of the population in the army in the 1980s that were women, and now that's around 10%. Training, as I described, was uh, single sex, so I joined uh, with 30-odd other women. Uh, women couldn't serve in field units or go on deployments, and indeed, you couldn't even come to Victoria Barracks here in Paddington, where we used to have a guard, so you'd come down for a week, guard the barracks, and run a parade, but clearly, uh, women weren't capable of doing that in the mid-80s. 
Of course, now we have women serving on operations across the globe in positions as diverse as engineers, pilots, United Nations, liaison officers, the field engagement teams that Liz talked about before. And we also have women in unit, base and formation commanders. And so a formation commander uh, can, in this case, uh, with Di Galash, command up to about 2,000 people. People often ask me, how do you lead in the army? In a male-dominated, physically demanding environment, does your style need to actually be different to the men's? And I often describe this as the femininity tightrope, where you're balancing being part of the group, but also maintaining your femini femininity. And certainly no female officers earn respect by trying to be one of the boys. And it's un unnatural to try to be a bloke, or in fact anything else that you're not. And I've certainly found that if you act in this manner, men will listen to you as the leader, but they're unlikely to respect you. So it's important to remain a woman, first and foremost, and not to underestimate the importance of self-esteem and self-confidence. And when you have confidence in your ability, you can make the most of the opportunities when they are presented to you. I remember one of my first bosses reinforcing to me that leadership is not a popularity contest. And I think of the words that Colin Powell's used, which ring pretty true, perhaps a little bluntly, on this subject, and that is, being responsible sometimes means that you piss people off. Now, obviously you can't keep everyone happy, and trying to can lead to risk aversion, avoiding the tough decisions and a less productive team. Respect is a much more durable asset than popularity. Leaders who crave being liked generally fail in their mission and in being liked. And there is no substitute for professional competence, which in the army includes fitness and high personal standards. Especially for women, you may not be the hardest in your team, but you must put in your best effort and show that you are prepared to meet the standards that you set others. And you also need to learn to adapt to the circumstances and adjust your approach accordingly. The first time that I deployed was 20 years ago as part of the Australian and New Zealand unit that was tasked to provide communications for the United Nations in Cambodia. This was a completely foreign work environment and culture to what I was used to, and we were operating with lots of other countries, including a number that did not employ women in their armies and did not respect those who served in armies like my own. This meant that I had to learn to do things differently. As Christine described, my role was the adjutant, and Christine, well done on trying to pronounce um, all those ridiculous terms and appointments that we have in the army. The adjutant is really the right-hand person to the commander. And we had people dispersed across all of the country, and we regularly crisscrossed by helicopter and rode, where possible, uh, to visit the soldiers that we had deployed. And I remember flying one day along the Vietnamese border in a Russian helicopter, flown by a Russian pilot who seemed to like UDL cans. <laughs> And uh, as I was looking out down onto the jungle and the farming land, and I noted that there were a lot of small dams in this part of Cambodia. And then it dawned on me that these dams were actually the result of carpet bombing. They were stark reminders of the scars of war on the landscape of Cambodia. And there were also stark daily reminders of the impact that war had on the Cambodian people such as amputees and orphans. And one of my most vivid memories is of an old woman who acted as a guide uh, for my group once at Tool Sling. For those of you who've been to Cambodia, that's in Phnom Penh, and it's where they used to torture people. And I had actually been there numerous times before, but never understood the true impact until this lady told me her story and how her family had been decimated by the Khmer Rouge some of whom had been tortured at Tool Sling and then later killed. And now she was eking out an existence without her family 
relying on the gruesome tourist trade for her livelihood. Through my experiences and observations in Cambodia, I realised that no matter how hard things or how hard I thought things had become, it can always get worse and that people in adversity can be incredibly resilient. I started to understand my own resilience and that to achieve results, you need to build resilience in all of your own teams. As you can imagine, teamwork and trust are two of the fundamental things for any effective team in the Army, in fact, in anywhere in the Australian Defence Force. Trust is personal, and while it is earned slowly, it can certainly be lost quickly. I have learnt that you need to be genuine and honest. Soldiers can sniff out lies from a hundred places. You must be honest, and you need to expect it in return. Truth should not be taken as a personal insult, and I believe that it is important to recognise people for being forthright. Now, of course, I would say that because I'm a redhead, and we're inclined to say what we think. And indeed, my mother has spent all of my life encouraging me to think a little bit more before I engaged my tongue. <laughs> if you want soldiers' trust, you also need to make it known that you want people's opinions, not what they think you want to hear. And perhaps one of the differences between the army and other professions, or many other professions, is that when you're on operations, you are trusting other people with your life. So you certainly don't want yes men, as they can be incredibly dangerous. General David Petraeus was one of the most inspiring leaders I've worked with, notwithstanding his latest or later indiscretions. <laughs> he was very strong on the importance of speaking the truth to power. He was also an expert on reinforcing his key messages and empowering those he commanded to make decisions. I deployed to Iraq as General Petraeus' Assistant Chief of Staff, where I was responsible for tasks such as security in the Green Zone and around the Embassy headquarters where the American Ambassador and the Commanding General worked from, coordinating the staff effort on the campaign plan and assisting the Chief of Staff, who was a two-star Marine General, to run the headquarters, which was around 1,500 people from a raft of different countries. It was a fascinating job in the centre of what I would describe as a complex multinational organisation under very stressful conditions. It can be very difficult to produce outcomes in such a large and diverse organisation with some countries having different agendas. If you wish to lead in these circumstances, you need to be comfortable and capable of dealing with complexity, uncertainty and, to a degree, chaos. You certainly need a simple sense of purpose that is clearly articulated to all. On operations, you work in teams, as I've explained, under extreme pressure. So leadership is crucial to success. And I would define or think of leadership as a combination of innate ability, education and experience. Theories are useless if you can't apply them. And the most important things are to understand and, your, and inspire your people to do their best. And I'm a stalwart for the importance of knowing yourself, knowing your job and knowing your people. And these three things will help you to succeed in pretty well any environment that you work in. Over the years, I've also come to appreciate that you need to motivate, cultivate and reward your people. Most importantly, you need to build a workplace based on trust and teamwork. And you need to ensure that your subordinates know that the buck stops with you, that they are responsible for their own actions, but ultimately, you are the one that is accountable. I've been fortunate to work with a lot of very capable women, but one who stands out is a young major who worked for me in Afghanistan. She selected trained and then deployed her specialist team for eight months to conduct a highly sensitive information gaining task. She knew the strengths and weaknesses of all her staff and was adept at adjusting to operational circumstances and getting the best from her team under difficult and demanding circumstances 24 hours a day. Because she was incredibly competent, a highly capable leader and knew what I expected, 
I trusted her implicitly to do her job. This meant even though this was the most sensitive and complex part of my organisation, the trust that we had built up between us meant that I could let her do what she needed to do. This then enabled me to spend more of my own time on other global or strategic aspects of my role as the Assistant Commander of the Australian Troops in Afghanistan. Now, I saw this young lady and leader last week, about a year after I returned from Afghanistan, and I'm pleased to say that she's now married and pregnant and loving life. She's still in the Army and one of the best officers I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, I'm certainly very proud to be a member of the Army and count myself as fortunate to have been able to serve for 30 years in an organisation that now provides the opportunity for Australians to serve their nation in whatever role they are capable of, regardless of their gender. During the course of my career, I've had some opportunities that I never thought possible, not least of which was Commanding Officer of the Royal Military College Duntroon and Commandant at Kapuka. I have trained and commanded some amazing young Australians and each of these roles has affirmed my confidence in not just the future of the institution of the Australian Army, but as part of the wider nation, the future of our society. In particular, I have worked with quite incredible young women who are smart, committed, tough and resilient, and just starting out their lives and careers. I am sure that these young ladies will achieve great things in the years and decades ahead. I am also grateful for the opportunities the Army has provided me, including deploying to overseas countries that are far less secure than our own, and contributing to the efforts to make those countries a safer environment for people to live, a place where women can prosper equally and not have to focus primarily on their survival. These are the things that we sometimes take for granted in Australia, a country where equality of opportunity is becoming a stronger fabric of our society. So whilst we sit here in these lovely surroundings this evening and quite rightly recognise and celebrate the achievements of some remarkable women, we should also remember that in many countries around the world, women fight every day for the basic rights that we take for granted. So as members of CEW, I encourage you all to continue to learn from others and provide opportunities for other women to prosper and achieve their dreams. Thank you.